Welcome to Studio Sessions, a program that highlights unique and special people. And we have quite a show for you tonight. We have Mr. James Burns, a man who studied economics and is here to explain how the American economic system works. He does it in a way that everyone can understand. And boy, we need that. He's written a new book, The Solution Revolution, a little economic history book to understand how the money flow and the money system actually works. And he's discovered that we've actually had several different systems over the years since the inception of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the studio session stage, Mr. James Burns. It's a pleasure, Richard. Thanks for coming on and telling us about your new book. Have a seat. Oh, yes. This is a fantastic book that you put together. And the title is Little Economic History Book, the Little Economic History Book. Why did you select that title? Um, well, when I was 23, I graduated from UC Santa Barbara in economics. Uh -huh. And I really wanted to learn about economic history. And so I dedicated myself to reading 20 economic history books a year. And I was able to accomplish that for 30 years. So I read 600 books. And I wrote a book of all the lessons in economic history that I'd collected in all those books, and it was an 800-page book. Oh. And I realized that, you know, people aren't going to read an 800-page book, so what I've done is I've broken it down to 180 pages of the best economic history stories that I collected from all these historians and all these administrators, legislators, everybody. And um, that's why that's the Little Economic History book. It's a working title. It's really the uh, solution revolution because my purpose, I had a purpose to learning economic history, and that was money systems work best when they're centered or structured around a specific goal. So like if you have agricultural society, you have a money system that promotes agriculture. If you go into industrialization, you have a money system that promotes industrialization. And when you go to war, you have an economy that m financially mobilizes for the success of the war. So, I know. So that is like a subtitle, the right. solution revolution. Now, a solution, what does that mean? Are, are we going to go to the barricades with flags and guns and stuff? Is that the kind right. of revolution you're talking about? Well, I believe that there's only one nonviolent revolution, and that is a war of words. And so we have to put together, my idea was what, what is the shortest string of words that I could put together to change the world? And I thought, you know, could, could I do it in a poem? Could it be a paragraph? Well, this is my opportunity here to put together the shortest string of words. It's what I call precise and concise. And every chapter is less than three pages because I realized that a person isn't going to sit there. If I'm going to introduce that many thoughts, I better keep it short. And I do it through story form because people like to follow stories. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist of economic history. I, I call that the soap opera of history. Is like if Rockefeller did something, I don't care what he believed or who he was. I cared about the actual mechanics yeah. of what he did. And then my story is it's exciting. It, it tells the mechanics of what he did. And the fact is, is that those money things that he did and the financial manipulations, they can be done again today, and they can be done where it promotes the welfare of everybody rather than just serving some private interests. Well, books have a great impact. The history is filled with examples. Uh, one that comes to mind is the opinions of human slavery, which was uh, identified by uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yes. It's got people to understand the horrors of slavery and rally the North against it in the Civil War. Other books come to mind, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Others have come out uh, as well. So a book is a great way to get your idea out there. Yeah, with a book, we can literally all get on the same page. And that's how you can actually have a revolution that brings about positive change. And it's the mechanics is that money is the most powerful social tool, tool yes. in existence. And it's through the money system that we coordinate our individual activities to produce something greater than ourselves. And so I looked at it and I thought, you know, uh, 
Joseph Campbell said, if you want to change the world, change the metaphor. Well, at a period of time when people um, acted, the, what, what controlled the way they conducted themselves in their life was their belief system, like their religion. Well, today, what conducts the way you um, behave in your life is your money, how much opportunity, the job, what you do with your time. I always say that time is all we have to spend. That's why they pay you per hour. So the thing is, is that with money directs your time. So my but idea. My question is, in our modern society, who reads anymore? Most people watch videos or uh, see uh, things on Facebook. They're not really interested right. in a book and or a volume. Do you have any way that you can get your ideas out through uh, the, the internet or through the social media? Well, in marketing, but I mean, that's why we're talking here today. I mean, when Socrates in his time, you know, he didn't believe in the alphabet. He didn't like the written word. He thought that ethics should be taught orally and yeah. history should be conveyed orally. So it wasn't until Plato to write down everything that Socrates said. And it wasn't until Aristotle that said, hey, this written word, this new medium is going to be what has to convey the wisdom of the past. Well, now we're living in an audio visual world. And yeah. so the written word, is being displaced. And just as there was a lot of wisdom from oral history that was never put down in books, a lot of book wisdom is never going to make it to audiovisual yeah. history, right? Well, um, th that was my thing, reading the 400 to 600 books that I read, is that I make it so you don't have to read those 600 books. You can read my book, and mine's what I call the greatest hits in thought. See, is that what somebody has to go through, and it's, it's actually an intergenerational responsibility for us to dedicate ourselves to condense down the wisdom that is in books into the modern day, into the modern medium. So here I am talking to you in an audiovisual world to reach the greater audience. Even if you don't read my book, then you can have, watch me tell well, the story. So this is sort of like a reader's digest of economic <laughs> thought, economic theory. And of course, the, the subtitle or your, your title is A Solution Revolution. Now, what is the solution? Well, first, before we describe that, what's the problem? What is the problem we have in today's society, our economic society? I would say that we are time conscious in the wrong way. Is that what we don't realize is that forethought is what separates us supposedly from the beast is that we can think ahead and mm -hmm. we're not thinking ahead far enough is that uh, the way the economic system is structured right now is that it may well bring a premature end to humanity so we've got to take a longer view of like what are our activities like i'm working today to feed my family to put a roof over my head yeah. but the thing is is i should be working today to make sure that my great 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 grandchildren can feed their family put a roof over the head so those are the boundaries of my behavior to perpetuate the species ultimately perpetuating the species is the expression of the will to survive see what happens is if there a money system has a goal then everybody works together to accomplish that goal and money is the means to that goal yeah. but when there is no social goal then money becomes an ends in itself and when money is an ends in itself every community ties deteriorate as everyone starts to see each other as competitors for the existing wealth in the world we can pick a new goal and we can work together to create something greater than ourselves and the new goal is the restoration of the planet and I'm saying that the Industrial Revolution, the environmental destruction of the Industrial Revolution, the bill has come due, and we have to pay it. We declare a war of environmental restoration, and we take the financial and legislative precedent set by World War II. There was a time when all of a sudden we realized we had to go to war in Europe, and we had to stop fascism, and so we work together to accomplish that goal, and we did, and we did it using our money system. Um, John Maynard Keynes had written a book in 1939 called How to Pay for the War. Okay, now we right now have a threat as great as Hitler. It's called really? environmental destruction, yes. And we have to restore uh, habitat, we have to clean water, we have to clean the air, and my idea is that we need a major jobs program so why not draft like all the 18 to 25 year olds in the world into what I call an army of awareness and we'll have a global exchange of youth 
like we did in World War II, but instead of sending our boys and girls overseas to dig ditches to shoot each other from, they can go overseas to dig holes to plant trees to restore soil. And my idea is in this book is that we give them a GI Bill when they get done with their service. And the GI Bill is what built the middle class in America. It had a voucher for higher education. And with that voucher for higher education, the returning veterans went to college and they remade the entire landscape of the United States. Humanity changes over time. Yeah. And so there is an evolution taking place that is accelerating so rapidly. Years and my generation are gonna be the last generations that grew up without a computer. We're going to be the last ones that remember three major networks. We're going to be the last ones who, like, if you didn't see the last episode of whatever major show there was that season, you wouldn't be able to talk to anybody for a month. That's true. Okay, nowadays, everybody's consuming their own media. They have their own choices. But we have to find some common ground. And like you said, is that people can rally around a book. Because a book is something everybody can keep coming back to, to reread it and get back on the same page. And we all know that when you read a book, a week later, two weeks later, you kind of digest it and start repeating it, whether you believe it or not. So, but when we watch a TV show, it kind of just glances off of it. It doesn't go as deep, you know? And that's why, you know, this is, this is also oral history. I'm, I'm speaking, so at least people are getting it coming through from my mouth to their ears. And then... Um, but any environmental change, which you're talking about, ha would have to be a world thing. It couldn't Correct. be done by just one country or even a group of countries Correct. like Europe and the United States, Canada. But it'd have to be something that the whole world would embrace. And I think the geopolitical structure is, I don't know if people would be able to work together, even in their own best interest. Right, but that's very parallel to like saying that the Berlin Wall will never come down. You know, you could just say it'll never happen. It's it's a forever thing. The truth is, is things are changing quickly. And well, it's true, right? And what we need is a major jobs program. And we have to change their value system. Is that you can't have it where you pursue a lifestyle that puts the future in jeopardy. What about robots? Uh, in fact, many say that in the future, robots will do all the work that people do today as manual labor. Right, but just because a machine can do something doesn't mean it should. If people find fulfillment and personal development through an occupation, then they should be able to pursue that. We have to realize that human beings are not an input to the productive process. We're the product. We're our greatest work of art. And so right now, the economic system likes to look at us and say, wow, the cheaper we can pay a person, then the more profit we can be made. And that's what this book is really about, is the corporate takeover, is corporations brought the world together through trade because they'll always put profits over people. Yes. But corporations make terrible social leaders because they'll always put profits over people. What happened was that corporations started to get powerful enough that they were able to pack the Supreme Court. And when they packed the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ha birthed a child, which was the corporation, and they want to spoil that child. They want to give the corporation the right to speak. They want to give the corporation the right to bear arms, maybe. Maybe there'll be private armies. They want to give corporations the right to have everything. And the thing is, is that um, the Supreme Court, when they founded it, they didn't think it was going to be a very strong institution. They thought it would be the weakest branch of government. Yeah, and they said, true. the weaker the power, the longer the term. So they gave them life appointments because they weren't going to be very strong. And so when John Marshall, the first Chief Justice, gave the Supreme Court all that power, their terms should have been limited right there. And that's the whole thing, is that we're living in a world, senators used to not be directly um, elected by the people. And so these things are changeable. The problem is, is that there's a, a challenge to our imagination, that people can't imagine the world being any different than it is today. And it can be, and it has been, and it's going to be. This money system that we have right now was put together after World War II to make sure that corporations, U.S. corporations, could go around the world and control all the finite resources. And it was very successful. It accomplished its goal. But we need a new money system. We need a new goal 
See, when you don't have a goal that the money is built around, then community ties deteriorate because we're not working towards something. Money's not facilitating the success of this greater thing. Money now is creating competition, cutthroat competition between us. So money is a tool and tools are only as moral as the hand that holds them. Like a hammer can be used to build a house or a hammer can be used to hit people over the head. Money's the same way. Mm -hmm. Money can be used to, to secure humanity's place on this planet or money can be used to bring it to an end. Well, I was growing up, I was uh, in the Cold War era. Now, much of the world, especially the third world, fell to uh, communism, which uh, was very attractive to people who didn't have rights, land, or what have you. So that was a competing different system. Mm -hmm. Yet that system seemed to give very little material wealth to the people it embraced. And later, most of right. them trashed them or junked them. The biggest example today is China which right. is now more corporate than probably the United States. Right, see in my book I explain, I believe in private property, that's why I feel everyone should have some. Mm -hmm. And so there are different forms of um, capitalism. There's, no. uh, there can be a capitalism which is a based on private property and markets, market pricing. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that a capitalism can be structured so that everyone owns a home. But you can also structure capitalism so that only 40% of the population owns a home. And what I'm saying is that if 40% of the population owns some private property and 60% of the population has no private property, then that system does not believe in private property. And what I see is that corporations and wealthy people are going to be able to buy up everything and everyone else is going to be serfdom. So you mean to say that in your way of thinking, the corporations will become larger and larger, the uh, aristocracy of wealth that gets to the point will be something like medieval Europe or 18th century Europe. Right. Corporations but only succeeded in taking over because they got government favoritism. See, the whole thing is that government isn't the enemy. A government is the prize. That's what Jefferson said. He said, look, the government is the tool of whoever controls it. Now, corporations got control of the government and then they got, because the government was for sale, and then the media was for sale and uh, corporations got control of the media. Then the corporations used the media to convince the people that the government was the enemy. And when Reagan got up there and said government's not the solution, government's the problem because he's a corporate mouthpiece, he did the United States, Americans and his base the greatest disservice because only a government can regulate corporations because corporations are the child of government. They're chartered by government. So let, let, me, just do, let me just explain this one thing. Okay, corporations mm -hmm. do not believe in the Bible. Okay. okay, what happened was is that in the 1830s there was a thing called usury. And usury is um, um, when you charge someone a really high interest rate. And the Bible said that that is wrong. And so the corporations went into the courtroom and said, look, we want to charge high interest rates, right? Well, they had to. And they said, we want God to mind his own business and stay out of ours. And corporations threw God and the Bible out of the court system. Okay, so then the people were, because that was common law. That was the way that the, the legal system worked. There was judges the difference between a court of justice and a court of law was that judges used to sit there and determine whether a contract was fair or unfair and judge on it. Corporations got it where judges are only there to enforce the contract that corporations have forced people to sign into, to buy into. Okay, so then state people realize, oh my God, we, we can't point to common law. We can't use the Bible in court. We've got to use state legislation. So they got legislation and they said, look, this corporation came into our community and it polluted our streams and it, 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 it exploited our children in child labor. We want to pass laws against them. And the corporation says, you know what? We don't like states' rights. We want states' rights overthrown. We want the federal government to come in here and what the corporations did, the corporate lawyers did, was they said, look, every state has its own set of laws and that patchwork of laws is really upsetting us because every time our goods cross a state border, we fall under a new formula of laws. So the federal government, being packed with corporate lawyers, the Supreme Court, said, okay, corporations can't be controlled by states. But then 
the corporation said, hey, we want, we're, they're all incorporated by um, state charter. They said, then New Jersey says, hey, we're going to let corporations do all this horrible stuff. And the corporations all moved to New Jersey. And they incorporated there. And they said, no, the federal government can't interfere with states' rights to g let us get away with the exploiting stuff. Because when I come into your community, let's say I move in, I'm your neighbor, and I start a business in your community, you know what I care about? I care about the kids walking to school in front of my business. You know what I care about? I care about the clean water coming to all of our houses. But when a corporation comes into your community, they don't have to care about you or your children or anything. They're taking, they're taking their, um, their directions from their headquarters a thousand miles away. So only a corporation can come into your community and say, I have no community responsibility here. I don't care about you guys. Well, I'm just here for profit. An example would be Walmart. Mm -hmm. They moved into an area. All the mom and pop shops were driven out of business right? by their low prices and their service. And they could, they could hire the marginal people who were not always able to find work pay them a low wage, and you would have a great system. So how do you stop something like that? It looks like a, like a, a dredge knot. You just can't stop something that's that powerful. Well, you know, I mean, this isn't in my book, but I, I use my imagination, and I, I try to think of things. And I, I came up with the other day, and you know, I'll just float this idea here, was if a business is got a headquarters outside of your area, it pays double sales tax. It's called a Community Preservation Act. Okay, mm. and so, but if a com if a business, the person lives in the community who owns that business and owns the land on that business, then they don't have to pay any sales tax at all. And so, what I'm doing is that right now. Walmart comes into a community and they're actually not even paying property taxes. Sometimes they, they set off a, what they call a bidding war. Walmart is in one community, hires 500 people, and it says, we're going to close our Walmart. We're going to move to another place. And that community says, no, no, don't move away from us. We'll give you tax breaks. So then Walmart is actually in a favored position over me, the little guy. So my idea is that like even in Walmart, if they're going to exist in my community, then 30% of their floor space has to go to local artisans, okay? Or open up their parking lot to arts and crafters, handcrafters and stuff like that, so that we, that the art and crafter can be where all the people are congregating to do their shopping. But if they, they keep, you know, they congregate everybody in that store and no one else has a chance at those people. And now we've got a problem with Amazon. People are ordering online and stuff. I mean, there, there's some major changes taking place, whether they're legislated or dictated or whatever like that. But what we have to do is, like, what's our goal? What about um, you're using taxes as a cudgel to uh, employ or, ch or be part of social change? Right. Uh, and people have done that in the past, such as sin taxes on cigarettes and other things. but. Is that really the best way to change people's hearts and minds? Right. Well, the thing is, is like a sin tax and stuff like that. When corporations got control of the media, they convinced the people that the economic system was a moral system. That if you were a moral person who sacrificed all other aspects of your life to working hard, you would be financially successful and secure. And it wasn't true. It, was, it turned out not to be true. It was just pure propaganda. But the thing is, is that the economic structure dictates the terms of the outcome. So I, a free market does not produce a middle class. Are you for or against a middle class? Well, of course. A middle class is the basis of all of our accomplishments here in the United States. Well, then a middle class is a social construct. You have to pass the tax code. That's how a middle class is created, through the tax code. And if you don't believe in a progressive tax code, then you believe in a two-class system. You may give lip service to believing in a middle class, but if you don't believe in a, t in a progressive tax code with marginal tax rates go bracketed, going up higher and higher, because the economic system exists to distribute wealth as broadly as possible. The economic system does not exist to concentrate all the money in the pockets of a few. It seems to be that way, though. I have friends in Mexico where they had a very vibrant middle class. It's almost totally extinct now after just a period of maybe two decades. 
Well, that's because what, they're what I call two classers. There's people who subscribe to a belief that there should be a have and have not society, and they're dynastic. What they believe is that it, all positions, all positions of social power in society should be inherited. They don't believe in a meritocracy. And see, the thi thing is, is that nepotism means fool's rule. Okay, so when you have all these people who inherited their positions, like our current president, like, you know, all these people who never worked for their position at all, is that they were handed it, okay? They're dynastic. He, our president is hoping his son takes his place, and he doesn't want his son to ever have to compete against, mer because in a meritocracy, talent rises to the top. See, but they, if you have a two-class system, then you are born into your station and you're stuck there. And we believed in this country that there should be a middle class, that there should be a meritocracy, that talent should rise. And only to ha the only way there can be social mobility is if you have a middle class, and a middle class can only exist through a progressive tax structure. So that's the logic that everybody has to understand. That's airtight logic, and there's just no way around it. There's a new mythology that's going on, and the people who are, uh, the, the thing is, is that when it comes down to economics, when it comes down to social morality, there's mm -hmm. really only two choices. There's generosity or genocide. And what spectrum are you on? If you're like, who's deserving and who's not? What spec, is that generosity or is that genocide? You know what I mean? Since most people are inheriting their positions, most of the wealth and the riches are not people who earned it. They were given it, and then they exploited on top of it. And I go, you know, this is off, off topic of my book, because my book really just goes over how corporations uh -huh. came in and took over. And then I go over World War II and the, and the uh, monetary architects that came in. So, uh, you know, we're getting more into like our, our personal beliefs, yes, but I course. do have it's a, a vision. Fascinating conversation. But it's a war of environmental restoration, and what I do is I take all the financial mobilization precedents, mm -hmm. administrative precedents during World War II, and I show how we can use them to create what I call an army of awareness, a global exchange of youth. And you're absolutely right. This bordered world is is outdated. Um, humanity. Basically, when I started writing, um, studying economic history, I knew the world would come together through one currency someday. Well, here's my problem, you know. as, as a, a being uh, a skeptic, a historian myself, is uh, you're talking about a one world system. Who's to say that one group or one man, be it corporations, be it Microsoft, whoever, won't become world emperor? And I think we're having, headed that way right now yeah, by well, not doing anything. Well, we're not doing anything right. about it. But now at least it's separated by countries. You, what about this situation where it's one world, you have no place to go to. It'll be completely the same wherever. And there'll be a small group of nobility who have all the control of the media, the power, dominating right. Everyone else. Right. Who That's why I believe I'm pro middle class. I know that most people are, um, say they're pro middle class and they promote and subscribe to beliefs that would destroy the middle class. In fact, I started writing my book in 1987 because I knew what Reagan had done to the uh, the tax code would mean that there would be no middle class, and we're there. This was all predictable. I mean, this this is no surprise where where we're at right now. I, I, it was obvious to me. It was obvious to a lot of the re writers and the uh, historians that I had um, read because they understood that a progressive tax code creates a middle class. Middle class is a social construct. If the middle class was a natural um, offspring of a free market, then history would be full of middle classes. But history is full of no. societies of have and have not. So what happened was the people that got at the very top that ha controlled the corporate media and stuff like that convinced everybody to vote and subscribe to beliefs that are in, not in their own interest. And so they're creating the serfs, again, are being promised heaven to not do the things that would create heaven on earth. Because money, system, money is all about confidence. You know, money is something we made up. And so money is a tool for us to use to secure our existence on the planet. Everybody's getting pummeled and clobbered with this money system when this money system could be facilitating our success. Yeah, but communism promised 
that everyone would be equal and they would advance. Yeah, I'm not promising that. I'm promising a three-class system where there's a meritocracy because there's social mobility. We're on studio sessions with Mr. Richard Sennett, and my guest tonight is Mr. James Burns, author of the little economic history book, The Solution Revolution. It's kind of interesting because economics is such a hard subject to get into people's minds. I know it's, it's always filled me with a great deal of confusion. Why I can't even do my own taxes, let alone talk about economic theory and what the monetary system has evolved or devolved into. Now tell me again, what was your motivation for writing this book? Uh, my motivation for writing the book was that um, I grew up where my father was part of Jerry Brown's environmental team of the 1970s. Uh -huh. And so I really understood that government had a role to play in preserving the environment. And he worked on roadless areas, scenic, uh, wild and scenic rivers, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, the Delta Board, and he ultimately became chief deputy director of the Coastal Commission. So I understood about the writing of legislation, and he told me that uh, environmentalists were losing in court because they couldn't make a valid economic case. So, so I majored in, I, I, when I went to college, I majored in economics and I wanted to know how the money system worked and how it justified the outcome that had been from our economic system. And what I found was that they don't teach economics right and they don't teach that type of economics. So I, I initially started writing a book called uh, Economics for Non-Economic uh, Majors because everybody has to take economics and it's so dry and it's so, you know, they teach about utils and elasticity of demand. And um, believe it or not, I, I read a book about the Pecora hearings and Pecora was the guy who did the investigation of why the stock market crashed in 1929. And what he uncovered was that GE had gone and written all the economic books for um, the universities and, and fired all the professors who taught economics in the way that I would. And what the, why GE did this was that when power plants were first invented and the production mm -hmm. of electricity, um, um, J.P. Morgan and Thomas Edison got together and Jettison said, I want to build power plants in every city and I want to make the money selling electricity. And J.P. Morgan was like, you know what? The money's going to be in selling appliances and getting patents. Well, Edison went forward with his plan, but what happened was um, he got money from J.P. Morgan to build uh, the very first power plant was right off of Wall Street and yeah. it illuminated the stock market and everything was a big thing. But um, what happened was that uh, there was a mayor of Cleveland, a guy named um, Tom Johnson. And he realized that as a municipality, they could float bonds and they could build their own um, power plant, right? And so they did that. And when they did it, it cost four cents a kilowatt hour to sell power to his local citizenry, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Edison, when he built a power plant, he was selling it for 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, so what happened was they realized, oh my gosh, if cities build their own power plants, they'll charge their um, clients the real price of power. Whereas oh. if a private company builds a power plant, they can overcharge their clients. So what happened was the, the power plant companies went and decided, hey, let's get legislation that if a city produces its own electricity, it can't sell to any customers outside the city limits. Uh -huh. and, but the private power companies could. And so what happened was there was a, a case in Pasadena. Cas Pasadena produced its own electricity for four cents a kilowatt hour. But what happened was GE, General Electric, came, General Electric, I mean power plants, right? Came in there and they sold it for two cents a kilowatt hour to drive the city out of business. And how they were able to do that was they overcharged all their other customers. So they purposefully took a loss to drive the cities out of production. Um, it was one of the reasons that FDR got his, um, um, his progressive label was he, as governor of New York, he looked over at the Hudson River and he said, hey, or no, at the St. Lawrence River, and he said, hey, the Canadians built a dam 
and they're selling electricity to their people for four cents a kilowatt hour. And we're getting our electricity for 16 cents a kilowatt hour. What's going on? And it turned out that the private power companies overcharge all their clients and they amass so much wealth that they could buy up the entire political system and they could buy up the entire media. Now, who owns NBC? Who owns the media companies? Westinghouse, General Electric, you know, and who was the spokesperson for GE? Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, that's one of the things that, like, um, Eisenhower did was that they wanted nuclear energy to be publicly run. But he signed on that he would allow it to be privately taken over. And he appeared on TV with a wand and said, someday nuclear energy will be too cheap to meter. And that was part of like why Eisenhower wasn't a man of the people. He had already sold out to the power companies. Look at the position we are in the world today. Power companies are leading to the oil wars. Power companies are the ones polluting. Power companies were able to overcharge every client. They were, everybody's electric bill that they've had their entire life for the last 100 years has been twice what it should have. And what they did with those profits was run a propaganda machine to make sure that people, because when a municipality floats bonds to build a all power plant, what do they call that? Communism. Socialism, socialism, right? So then they said, okay, we've got to make sure that nobody understands that term. So that's why they, in the Pecora hearings, he found out they would paid $10,000 to professors to write economic books to make sure that it justified the private ownership of, pow of power. So money uh, corrupted the whole system. And the fact that they could make a lot of money on a commodity, electricity, which right. everyone needed, uh, wouldn't, couldn't you say the same would be true of the computer and the right. internet systems we have? Facebook comes yeah, to mind, Bill Gates, Microsoft. Yeah, the Bill Gates is only rich because he had government enforcing his patents. He lost an antitrust suit because he cheated to get where he is at. Bill Gates amassed like $60 billion and never thought to give a dollar away. They actually had to come to him and go, you know what, you have to give some of that money away. And he goes, what do you mean? I never even thought of that. What, think of other people? And that's the problem with our economic system right now is that it concentrates money in the hands of those least capable of taking care of the general welfare. These guys, Bezos and stuff like that, they can't think of other people. This is, that's not their capacity. So like I say is that right now, corporations brought the world together through trade because they pursued profits. Mm -hmm. That was a great thing. But they make terrible social leaders because what does a corporation do? They always put profits over people. Corporations don't need clean air. They don't need clean water. They don't need educated children. They don't need you to own a home. Corporations want to maximize that bottom line, and that's why they make terrible social leaders. And so the thing is, we've got to either, we've got to change the system because well, we can't. What about communism? It's, it was founded with the belief that they were for the common man. Yeah, but and, if corporations own all the property, then what's the difference? We might as well be well, communists. Shouldn't it be the, the, public, the people owning it? That's what the communists told everyone, that their power plants, how come they get, didn't get dirt cheap power plants? How come if, the, if one entity owned everything, how come it proved to be such a horrible failure? Well, Marx said that communism would only come as a middle class revolution, that it would be an advanced society, and that the middle class would realize that public ownership of things was the best way to go. Because because then they wouldn't overcharge the people and it wouldn't amass in the hands of a few that then would become uh, aristocracy, autocracy, uh, totalitarian. So all these uh, Soviet right. states right. and all were not really communist at all. In fact, they were just another form of corporatism. Correct. And the thing is, is that Russia was in no state of an advanced democracy. Of course to, not. Right. So then that was Lenin came in and says, oh, no, we can take a backward ass agricultural place and turn it communist and we'll skip the whole building of a middle class education of the people. So the examples that we have of communism now were, aren't valid. You know, the thing is, is that the, what Marx said, Mar Marx was, he wrote a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they've cherry picked him to make him sound very bad. And you know, he ended up inheriting a bunch of money and just taking time off and being bourgeoisie. I mean, well, he, he, was, he was very bourgeoisie himself. Yeah. Many in the communist revolution.
Yeah, and, and that was the thing is that, you know, people have, they don't understand the terms of so socialism or communism, and I don't like to use any of those labels because um, there, there's corporations that have amassed so much wealth by overcharging their customers on energy that they were able to confuse the vocabulary so that an honest debate could never take place. Now, you talked about <laughs> education. It seems to be one of the key to maybe making a system like you're talking about work is through the educational system. Right. But if the corporations fund the universities and fund the books being printed, just as, as you said Edison did uh, with the Depression uh, and what happened there, aren't we in danger of trusting too much to education and people, instead of becoming educated, become mindless uh, robots to spouting what they're indoctrinated to believe? Yeah, and that's always been the problem. And, you know, um, what happens is that you have to teach people to think, okay? Like Very you, true. you have to. You also have to teach children to share. It doesn't come naturally to them. They're just like they know what mine is. And if if you if a child takes something out of the hand of another child, that child cries. And then what you do is you take the the toy out of the hand of the child that took it, and you go when you take something from someone and you don't ask them, it hurts their feelings. And so then the child goes oh, and they say, but when you give something to someone, it makes them feel better. And what happens is that then a child learns, oh, there's self-reward in giving. Now, some people feel that so much has been taken from them, they owe nobody anything. And they've lost the ability to have any reward from giving. Or the concept of victimization. Correct. There's so many groups, especially being identified today as a victim group. And the list is quite long. I won't go through it. But if you believe and accept that mythology that uh, you have been victimized because of your right. belief system or the clothes you wear or the color of your skin or uh, the language you speak even, um, this kind of could, I think, really work on your mind to the point where you think you, are, you owe it to have things that other people have. And so taking mm. them is justified somehow even if it means taking a life. Right, but yeah, and, and the thing is is that you're saying about the victimization is that when people see themselves as victims, they're less generous. Yeah, of course not. See? They, they, the fact they think that they're right. owed. But something. individually, we have very little, but together we have everything. Yes, of course. And, and right now, we know that there are, that if humanity made um, securing everyone's necessities in the world its goal, we could accomplish that. So not only do we have well, the resources. How, how much do, do everyone need, though? Does everyone, for instance, need a car? No. Why? Because I, mean, I like to drive around. Yeah, I could get around in California I was just in Mexico City taking public transportation, and it was great. I, I enjoy the whole, the whole experience, and it could even be made better. You so know? everyone should be able to ride public transportation for free. Right, but the thing is, is that time is all you have to spend. That's why they pay you mm -hmm. per hour. So the thing is, is right now, they've convinced you that your time is to work an 80 hour a week for a job that you can't even afford to own a home. Okay, that's where we're headed. That's where your grandchildren are headed. Does your grandson deserve to have a 40 hour a week job that he can own a home, retire not in poverty, be taken care of if he's sick, and send his kids to college? And he does deserve that. And one time, that was possible. Mm -hmm. And it's still possible today. Can we go back, into, back to that particular model that made the middle class possible? Right. And that is, yes, very true. And that's why everything I propose in my book mm -hmm. has precedent. I don't invent anything new. I only use the, what worked in the past. It's the greatest hits in thought is that there are things that worked in the past and like imagine that like how uh, Ross Perot said if we uh, we got to lift up the hood of the the uh, economy and work on the engine okay say the economy is a car engine and it has a radiator it has mm -hmm. a fuel pump it has a carburetor it has all these different working parts okay now if I go in there and I put a brand new radiator in the car is still not going to work if all the spark plugs are, are, are plugged, right? right? So all the solutions to our problems have never been tried at once. We've actually fixed every component of a car, our car engine, our economic system, but we've never done it all at the same time. And what I'm saying is that we can build a middle class.
Okay, I want to raise the level of human satisfaction. I want to give people more free time. It's our hyper -ac economic activity that's going to bring the planet to an early end. And we don't have to do that. We have to think ahead. We have to exercise forethought. That's what makes us an intelligent creature. We planted in the spring, we harvested in the fall, and our numbers grew in the winter. Mm -hmm. So we thought ahead. But now thinking from the spring to the fall is not enough. We have to think from this year 100 years out. Well, what about robots? If uh, pretty soon there will be no jobs for anyone because robots will do that, and they're certainly much cheaper than human beings, because right. once you buy your robot, you don't really need it anymore. Well, it doesn't have health care, it doesn't want a vacation, yeah, it, it works 24 All you gotta do is put the electricity right. to him, and he'll work 48 hours uh, at a time. But that sounds, like, that, sounds a like, that sounds like a social system that puts profits over people. Yes. Okay, but money's something we made up. But here's the question. Money doesn't exist in nature. And for, money is a tool for us to, to increase our satisfaction as human beings and not a system to enslave ourselves in. And that's why I talk about that you know, we've been through all these economic money systems mm -hmm. through our history here in this country. This isn't the last money system. We're still moving towards it. But my utopian vision of the war of environmental restoration mm -hmm. set, um, based on the precedent, economic precedent set by World War II Okay, the guys that um, did, were the economic planners of World War II and the financial mobilization that made it so that we defeated fascism, that their administrative tactics that they made happen can make it so that we can free people up to have more time for themselves, for their community, for their family, and less time in the workplace. Robots are not the villain, they're freeing us up. And so what I talk about in my book about the War of Environmental Restoration is we draft all the 18 to 25 year olds, we have them have a global exchange of youth, and instead of killing each other like we do in war, we have them restore habitat, clean water, stuff that. We so give we have a, like a giant peace corps or something like that? A civilian conservation corps, you okay. know, the CCC. Okay, then they get a GI Bill. They come home and they go, and war is always great for social transformation. War is when we went, in the Civil War, we went from agriculture to industrial revolution and in World War II the economy completely changed again. Yeah, but it cost millions of lives. Too. Right, but it's the mechanics of the money system that facilitated the change. We don't have to kill off all the people. We don't have to go through the bloodiness of that. We can just adopt. It was, uh, it was the war made it so everybody was willing to accept a new system. They, right. You know, it wasn't until they killed each other that they would said, okay, this isn't working. Let's do something else. I'm saying let's skip the war. Let's skip the, the violent war and let's just go straight to changing the system. But like, remember the war on poverty that, that Johnson started. It started out, we had so many poor people. At the end of the war, we had doubled the number of poor people. Right. We and lost the war. Well, for one thing, the frame of a war on poverty was a bad thing. But the thing is, is that he didn't do it like the GI Bill. The GI Bill was like giving every veteran uh, an inheritance that he would have never gotten from his position in society, right? Mm -hmm. and, if, and the problem is, is that the, the, the uh, war on poverty, w the way it was structured, was really bad. It said, OK, we're not going to give you money. Money. We're going to make you do this program, and we're going to make you stand in line, and we're going to have people tell you how to do it, and stuff like that. Where the GI Bill just put money in your pocket and said, I have faith that you'll use that money to make your life better. And you know what? The Republicans, the conservatives, leadership was against it. Mm -hmm. They were just like, these, the boys, the veterans are heroes overseas, but they're going to be bums at home. You put money in their pocket, they're just going to sit on the couch. The, the GI Bill said you get 52 weeks of unemployment insurance. You could just come home and take a year off. You know how much the average veteran took? I don't know. Like as little as possible. It's just like welfare is that single mothers get welfare because you know welfare is for children. You know a, a single parent with children. The average woman that needs welfare because a, there's a crisis in her life, she's off it in a year, 18 months max, and she needed that money to facilitate her success to take care of her children. But then we get this 
episodic, like this one person stayed on for five years, these people are handing it down generation to generation. That's not the truth of the vast majority. That's the truth of the commercial media of the guys who are I, overcharging us. I will us. disagree with you on that. And I can speak from personal example, because mm -hmm. our family was on welfare. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like. And it's a very dehumanizing system. Right. The system is wrong. Right. And it was not just money. You had to comply with all of their uh, rules and regulations. They literally You're making my putting, point. putting a person in charge of your right. family's life. Yeah. And it got to the point where if you told them the truth, they would simply cut your benefits. Right. So you had to lie. It turns you into a lie. Right. The GI Bill would have put money in your pocket and said, make better of your life. The war on welfare, or, I mean, the war on poverty that LBJ put in there was set up to humiliate you and never give you the money. And made it worse. Yeah. You know, instead of better. I'm just Our saying good case with welfare today is they give women with children money but not married women with a husband right. with children, right. which is, means the husband has to leave right. in order to get the money. Right. Or they come and visit each other, have more children right. that way. This doesn't work, and now you have the poor right. children without a father figure, right. and they become uh, wild or not achieving their maximum gold. So or they I, have to lie and hide the fact that they're together. Yeah, which is right. wrong. I should actually right. say, if that you have a husband fault. and wife, it should give you more money, not right. less. That's the fault of our political leadership, ah, not the right. people. The people, we know, we know what's right and wrong, and we know how we are. We're just being considered of like, hey, you think you got it hard. Those people are getting it easy over there, and they're telling those people over there, you think you got it hard. Those people are taking advantage of you over there, when the truth is, is who's pitting us against each other and we're living in a new world where you and I can talk to each other and through social media I'm talking to people who live in Iraq I'm talking to people who live in yeah. Argentina you know I mean this is there's there's a new technological boom that's making it so that we can set the agenda like you're talking about earlier personally we're talking about um, gay marriage and gay rights is yeah. that did not come from up high down low it came from us the people up and that's, that's why true. They did everything to stop it, even going so far as to change the constitution of the state of California. Right. But finally, people realized that it was a bogus argument. And the fact that people love each other, they should be allowed to marry. And all the, the little straw men they put up, oh, it's going to open the door, people will be marrying their cats, or, or they're going to have polygamy, all sorts of different things. All that proved to be vacuous nothing yes. there but they changed people's but there's those people hearts. are still in power and they're still um, pulling the strings and they're still dividing us like that. What I'm saying is like, like let's put our eye on the prize is what we want is sure. the the world doesn't need human beings to model themselves after insects it's, where we have one queen and we're all worker bees, okay? What we want to do is develop, we have so much potentiality that hasn't been realized. Yeah. We need the time and the resources and the time and the resources exist for us today. And what I was gonna say is that war is a great time for uh, a transformation. What the yeah, idea I haven't talked about in the book is I talk about the educational society. And what happens is that I have this war of environmental restoration, global exchange of youth and a GI bill and, the, and they come back and everybody can go to universities and when the veterans came back from World War II they changed the whole university well, landscape I mean that did. is how the African-American veterans went and got their law degrees to become the civil rights lawyers of the 50s 60s and 70s you know I mean that's and that, and that's what I'm talking about and then also is that you're a person like myself is that you're mental and you would rather spend time learning than owning something. You know what I mean? You're yeah, but I have to admit that not everyone thinks like me or I'm sure like yourself. There are people who don't belong on a college campus. They have different ideas, different well, goals. Well, the existing structure of a college campus doesn't offer what they are into. I mean, college right. should have gardening. You know, you should be able to do an eight-year program. Okay, 
when the GI when the GIs came back after World War II, mm -hmm. they, they got a GI Bill, which I called a cat. The university system was a catch and release system. It caught you for four or eight years and put you back in the private economy. What I'm saying about when this new the Army of Awareness gets their GI Bill and they come back to the university system, it can be a lifetime pursuit. Like you can acknowledge that you don't want much of a material existence, that you want to be mentalistic, not materialistic, and that what you want to do is possess knowledge. And the most satisfying thing in life is to be surrounded by people who share your interests. A football pan fan loves to be in a room with football fans. Uh, a fisherman loves to be in a room with fishermen. And a person who's into economic history loves to be in a room with people who love economic history. The university is the environment that provides that ability where we could all be sitting in classes or whatever structure we use as learning, maybe outside in amphitheaters, of having somebody like, just, this is just one of the things. In the 1920s, they started to excavate all the old cities when, mm -hmm. um, when people, when pedestrian traffic had priority. Okay, there were no cars and people, and what um, my favorite philosopher was a guy named Lewis Mumford. And he, what he did was he said, what, what was the existing civic equipment that existed back in ancient times. And he showed that the amphitheater was this amazing place where people did plays and heard speakers and stuff like that. And he showed that their dormitories where people slept was a 45 minute walk. Mm -hmm. And he said the thing was is that it was that walk back to where you're gonna sleep that was the most exciting thing. Because that's where you got to discuss what you just, con the media you just consumed. Um, the thing is that I believe in a suburban revolution. The suburbs right now are culturally barren. Oh, very much. Because they don't have any civic equipment. But they don't even have people there because people are working all the time. People don't even live in their houses. They just get their mail there and sleep there. But the thing is is that you know, it needs museums. It needs gardens. And, and, and the thing is is that we don't need more stuff. We need more time. And if we have time, we'll cultivate interests in all aspects of life is that what does it mean to be a fully developed human being? What right. does it mean to be psychologically healthy? These are questions that can be answered. But one of the things you mentioned, you were talking about universities. One of the things I highlighted when I went to school was to get a well-rounded education, to be exposed to new ideas, right. not just history. I was a history major, not just have that. I had a lot of history classes, but I also had other things that I took. Yeah, and art appreciation, art music, appreciation, film. Uh, fencing, film. Yeah. Uh, the class, by the way, that, uh, that taught me the most Storytelling, mm -hmm. and I stumbled into that class, and I had this been a great help. And, and you could have spent a understand. lifetime, maybe, pursuing mm -hmm. that and if it paid. But you, it gave you a smorgasbord of new ideas, and that's what I think education is really all about. Not just one track. Oh, I'm computer oriented, or I'm in this track, but in fact, giving you a whole smorgasbord of new ideas, new thoughts, new people, where you could share and learn and develop as a human being. Right, and that's why in this book, mm -hmm. I show the mechanics of money and how it can facilitate that transformation. Not only can we build a money system that fulfills the intergenerational responsibilities of yeah. providing the planet, of providing the future humans with a healthy planet and a psychologically healthy culture, see? And I'm telling you, with this money system, because, uh, you know, you, we can have a good time doing it. We can have a good time doing it. If we save humanity from itself, if we don't blow ourselves up, if we don't overpopulate the planet, if we don't destroy the environment, we're gonna go down as the heroes in history. We've never been up against a challenge as big as the one we face today. If we turn this world around and we become a positive influence on the planet, it'll rank in there with the initial capturing of fire. <laughs> the initial capturing of fire was a momentous event in human history. We have that chance to be part of something that momentous. And the future will look back and they will romanticize what it must have been like to have lived through such a great era of change that we are capable of bringing about. Well, and I, I we'll be the heroes of history. We could be the heroes of history. All we have to do, and it's a question of morale. We got a morale problem. 
We've got to like unite and make this thing happen. And I got a plan. We can all get on the same page. Mm -hmm. And that is what I'm saying is that, you know, I'm looking at it, the big picture. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And I don't need things to make me happy. I want to be, I want activities that make me happy. And the activities I want to pursue are the ones I know that are going to secure humanity's future. Well, thank you. You uh, right. really outlined a great, a great program, and I think that you have a lot of great ideas in this book, which definitely I recommend people read, the Little Economic History Book, and how can people get it? Uh, just look up uh, the A Solution Revolution, the Little Economic History Book online, and it'll come right up. You just Google it. You know, like everything nowadays. So. Yeah, everything's on Google. Well, thank you very much for coming thank and you, explaining Richard. this unique work. I, I, this is years of years of effort you put together to form this concise kind of a guidebook through the economic history of the United States and the world. Thank you, Mr. Burns, and thanks for coming on and telling us about your fascinating book. How can people get it? Um, they can look my name up online with the Little Economic History Book or uh, Solutions Revolution. All right, thank you very much for explaining this fascinating subject and making it clear. I would like to thank you for watching this episode of Studio Sessions. And join us next week as we have future guests appear and talk about fascinating elements of our world. Thank you and good night.